Good evening and welcome to Film Forum, Atlanta's, movies, Atlanta's newest movie talk show, where we'll be reviewing the latest films and keeping you in touch with the film industry here in Georgia. I'm Steve Marcos. I'm your host each and every week, and along with me, as always, is Aaron Siegel. How are you doing tonight, Aaron? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing a little better. I was a little sick last week, but I'm getting over it. But Got over if, the cold. Yeah, if you see me gulping a little bit, <coughs> you know it's because I, I still got a little bit of it, but I'm getting there. Uh, tonight's show, we'll be reviewing a couple movies as usual. Uh, one movie that came out last Friday and a film coming out this Friday. Aaron, why don't you tell us what we got for him tonight? We've got uh, Consenting Adults and Zebrahead. Consenting Adults and Zebrahead. All right, tune in for that. Towards the middle of the show this week, keeping with the, hol the Halloween spirit, our critics' choice will be alien monster movies. And I'll be giving you my top three. Aaron will be giving you his top three. And at the end of the show, a very special guest who Aaron again has rounded up, and Aaron is going to tell you about him and why you should not turn to the Braves game and watch our show tonight. <laughs> Aaron, who we got? We've got Willard Stevens on tonight. Willard is a, uh, with uh, Black Eagle Special Effects, and he'll be uh, on later on in the show, so uh, stay tuned. All right. And again, let's remind you that we are a call-in show. Uh, number is 873-6713 if you have any comments about movies we reviewed, movies you'd like us to review, or questions for the guest at the end. But let's get started. We've got a lot to do. Uh, again, Aaron, I'm going to let you start off with tonight's first film. What one do you want to do? I'll start out with Consenting Adults. All right, go ahead and tell us about it. Consenting Adults is a, is a film uh, <coughs> with Kevin Kline, uh, Kevin Spacey, Rebecca Miller, and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. It was just released. It's a Hollywood Pictures release. And what I'd like to do is uh, I'd go, like to go ahead and, and give you a little bit of an idea of what the story's about. Uh, what goes on in the film is this is uh, about two neighbors that uh, are, uh, are, are they, they're very social. They get along very well together. And uh, one of the neighbors ends up framing his, his friend uh, for the murder of, of his wife. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go to the clip, and I'd like to set it up for you real quick. What goes on is uh, Kevin Klein is in jail. He has just been uh, been put in jail for framing, uh, for being, uh, uh, he's been accused of uh, murdering his neighbor's wife. And uh, he's talking with his lawyer, uh, E.G. Marshall, and uh, with his wife, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. So if we can go to the clip now. You have to help me understand this, Richard. Please help me. Please. Everyone wanted it. Seems like everyone was pushing me to do it, even you. Who was pushing you to kill her? Any other person, other than your husband, enter your room the night of the murder? No. No, of course not. That was your story. But you have to... I thought that was something the papers made up. Would you please? Would you please think of some other defense, please? How oh, could this have happened? How could you have done this to Lori, Richard? How could you have done this to our, our family? Richard! That was a clip from uh, Consenting Adults, directed by Alan Pakula. And that was the movie that came out last Friday. Uh, okay. What did you think of it, Aaron? I'll let you start off with it here. Um, I liked it. I thought it was. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, it was. Uh, it was enjoyable. There. There were. Uh, there were uh, situations. That it was uh, humorous in, in mm -hmm. certain situations, and you kind of got an idea of what uh, what uh, Kevin Klein was thinking when uh, when all of this was going on. I thought it was written very well. Um, the uh, the characters seem to be uh, portrayed very well. Yeah. I, if I can say the word on TV, say this movie pissed me off because so much of the plot advancement in this film was was based on a theory of stupid people doing stupid things, and I really don't like that in a film. I think when someone's getting paid five hundred thousand, probably minimum to write a script, they need to to come up with more believable situations. For instance. Uh, the clip we saw, uh, Kevin Klein says something a slip of the tongue to make himself even incrimin incriminate himself even more, makes his wife believe he's done the murder, and what's he do? 
nothing. He just sits there, doesn't say anything. I'm sitting there, just tell her what happened, what happened here. Well, the and, thing uh, the problem is, is that, you know, nobody believes him to begin with. Yeah, but that's because everyone's stupid. You have this insurance frame up, uh, he, you know, with the uh, insurance policy on his wife. That's true. $1.5 million. Earlier, we saw the, the, the same guy, Kevin Spacey, who framed Kevin Klein, got a $30,000 insurance settlement for another scam. You think that people would put those two together? Like, how can someone be that lucky that they get thirty thousand one week, one point five million the next, right? And not exactly. connected to a lot of stupid things. This movie is very similar to what I thought to Hand the Rocks, the Cradle, or Pacific Heights, in, in that it's about a nice family who someone comes into their life that looks very nice and ends up turning their life upside down. Just beware of your neighbors. Yeah, which which in this case they frame him up for murder. The frame up I thought was really good, and there's a plot twist in there that's also very good. However. Too many times people do stupid things and, and to, to make uh, Kevin Klein look more incriminated. It's kind of like Friday the 13th mentality. Oh, you, I don't know if, it's, know if it's it's really that. Well, I'm not saying that's when you knock Jason down. What do you do? You pick up the knife and you kill Jason. But what do they always do in the movie? They do they the walk stupid away. thing and they walk <laughs> away. And this movie did, had too many stupid things. It was thrilling. I, was, I felt suspense and everything. But too often, I wish I could have concentrated just on that thrill and that suspense and not really had just kept saying to myself, you know, give me a break, would you? I mean, no one's that stupid, and it, and it just happened too much. Whereas in Hand the Rocks the Cradle, uh, like when Rebecca de Mornay did something, it was very believable. And, uh, and I felt that if when these writers are getting the big bucks they are, they should have done something more believable and not take the easy way out. It really angers me. I like this, this part for uh, Kevin Spacey as well. You might yeah. want to remember him from... Uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, uh, yeah, when he played the office manager. Totally different part. It was even yeah. hard. He even looked different. Right. You know, all the acting was good, and it was a thriller. I just wish. The thing that made me so angry about the film is that it had the potential to be a great film. The majority of the film was also filmed in Atlanta, which yeah. I, th I thought, thought it was a plus. All right. And for our stars, let me, I, I would say, number one, we have a four-star system here. I don't think we've ever cleared that That's up true. with people. I would give it two stars, which is a little bit below average, because I would have given this three and a half, four stars if they hadn't have resorted to that stupid people doing stupid things. It is still a thrilling movie, but that just bothered me. I think I, I, I'm on the average I'd give it three stars. So three stars. Because, because in a way, it's like it was an enjoyable film. It wasn't something that you would walk out of. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, it, it was enjoyable. It was a thriller, again. It was as thrilling as Pacific Heights and Hand at Rock's Cradle. So me. I guess we average those out to two, two and, and a half. half stars, yeah. So check it out if, if you still want to after what we've had to say about it. All righty, well, we're going on to our second film coming out this week, Zebrahead. This is supposedly a semi-autobiographical story based on director Anthony Dresden's life. It's the story of a white teenage male who, for lack of a better word, is a black wannabe. I guess kind of the way that Michael Jackson may want to be a white wannabe. He's grown up in, in Detroit in a black neighborhood. He, all his friends are black. He likes the black culture. He, he even listens to rap music. He's accepted by the black people as just a human being, a good guy. There's no prejudice amongst, amongst him or his friends. That is until he decides to date a black female. At that point, a lot of his friends turn on him. Some of them stand by him, but he becomes not the nice guy they knew, but more of now he's just another white guy trying to take something away from the blacks. And in this case, a beautiful young lady away from the, a lot of the black bachelors of the neighborhood, and a lot of people resent that. We have a clip here of the, of the film towards the beginning of a, a group of the black girls sitting around talking about the different types of races of people they would like to go out with or wouldn't go out with. I'd go out with him. No, I ain't even with that. I would. He's fine. No, he ain't. Oh, no, white boy. No. Why wouldn't you go out with a white boy? No. I just wouldn't. All right, then. Would you go out with a Dominican? Yeah, the right one. My motherfucker on crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, would you go out with a Chinese boy? Yeah. You go out with a Chinese boy before you go out with a white boy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> By yourself. Say he gets angry at you and start cursing you out in that Oriental talk. You not gonna understand a word he's saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right, dear, would you kick it with an Italian boy? All right, that was a clip from the new movie Zebrahead coming out this Friday. I'd like you to look at this on a technical point of view and on an entertainment wise. And I'd like to say, technically, I felt this wasn't up to par with Hollywood films. Uh, I agree with you there. Uh, it, was a it was a movie about high school kids. It almost seems sometimes that high school people were making the movie. And it may be in my mind because of a first-time director. And that is a little subjective. 
me. I felt that the the, the soundtrack was uh, yeah, that was the was main <laughs> objection I had. <laughs> was it was just uh, too chock full of uh, of, uh, of rap, rap and yeah, often there wasn't times. anything else except there were a couple of uh, times where they went to different uh, different songs. Yeah. But well, the main part was sometimes the rap soundtrack was so loud you couldn't hear what the people were saying, uh, particularly true. in the in the uh, uh, what was it dance scene at the end of the roller skating rink. And I felt it was done for two reasons: number one, either carelessness, or number two, they're more interested in promoting this rap soundtrack and selling soundtrack albums than they are for people uh, to hear what's going on in the film. I've noticed on the on the uh, commercials and such, they they keep mentioning you know, rap. Uh, score yeah. by such and such. Yeah, and, and like I said, we want to hear what, what the characters have to say. and not We don't want to have to hear the rap so loud. And it's not oft, not always is the case, but there are times when it's just too loud and it's just bad sound mixing technically. Technically also, it, it seems to be uh, done as an amateur type film. Mm -hmm. it, it, in some cases. It, you get the impression that this film is, is done like a, 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 what, uh, I guess what you said, a, a high school or college Mm -hmm. uh, well, it was the first time director. All the actors are first time. I thought all the acting was very good in the movie. The acting was done mm -hmm. well. Now, entertainment-wise, I like to say that I don't think that this is a must-see movie. And the fact, what I mean by that is not good or bad, but if you have an interest in the subject matter, it sounds like something you'd like to do, I think that you would really enjoy seeing the movie. If it's something you have no interest in, don't see it. And I know that sounds obvious, but sometimes there are must-see films that you have no desire, and when you get them, you know, everyone tell, uh, excuse me, tells you to go get them. And you see them. For instance, I had never seen Jungle Fever. I personally saw it because it had it was related to this film. I never wanted to see the movie. I saw it, and it was a damn good movie. That's kind of like a must see film. This movie, if, if you're not interested, stay away. If you're interested, I think that you will probably enjoy it. I think the one other thing that we need to point out here is that the film does deal in reverse racism, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just uh, uh, a lot of black people might might. Be offended by it. Yeah, what I was surprised they had the director at the showing. I left early, but you said I figured the black critics would love it because it the, was dealing. No, with No, the there was a lot writer, of controversy, and about I was surprised that. to see they didn't like it. No, so that'll be coming out Friday. So we'll have to see uh, what kind of uh, criticism or or trouble this movie is going to stir up. Is it going to be like Boys in the Hood or some of these other movies? Okay. Uh, for stars, I'd give it again two stars, a little below average because of because of, I take away for technical things, and I know some people really. A lot of people that go to movies don't care as long as they're entertained. I'll give it two stars as well. All right, so we're giving this one two stars. All righty. We want to remind everybody that uh, we are a live program, and you can call in. The number is 873-6713. All right, now we go to the Atlanta Top Ten box office. Right. And I guess, Aaron, you go ahead and read those <laughs> off. Okay, uh, coming up this week, uh, or for the, uh, this past weekend, the Atlanta Metro Atlanta box office. Uh, number 10, dropping from number 9, is Captain Ron. That's Kurt Russell and Martin Short. Dropping from number 5 to number 9 is 1492. We mm. reviewed that last week. That's fading very well. It's a great movie. I just wish a lot of people are staying away because it's, you know, because of the Christopher Columbus. Columbus really. But it's a good movie. Uh, number 8 is uh, Hero. That's with uh, Dustin Hoffman and Gina Davis. That falls from number 7. And at number 7 uh, is Sneakers. This is the sixth week in the top 10. It yeah. drops from number six. Number six this week is Mr. Baseball. It, it drops out of the top five. For the first time. It's been about what, three weeks. Three weeks. Top five. And we reviewed that a couple of weeks ago. Number five is The Mighty Ducks. That's with Emilio Estevez. That's the Bad News Bears on Ice, kind of, is what it is. It, uh, was last week it was at number three. Uh, number four this week is Consenting Adults. We just reviewed that. It, debu it debuts right at number four. Number three this week is uh, Candyman. Along with Consenting Adults, uh, it's the other new film in the top ten. Uh, that's the Clive Barker film. Uh, yeah, my sister saw that. Known <laughs> for the Hellraiser movie, so he replaces Hellraiser she 3. She said it was a great movie. film. My sister loved it. So. Okay. Number two uh, for the second week in a row is Last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day-Lewis. And a number one this week for the second week in a row is Under Siege. That's mm -hmm. the uh, Steven Seagal film. Yeah, the surprise to me is that Last of the Mohicans, it was at number one. One for two weeks, and now at number two for two weeks. I'm surprised that it's a good movie, but to be that high up for so long is pretty interesting. I also got a chance to see Under Siege. It's, a, it's a very good film. It's mm -hmm. well, that's good to hear. I, I, I'm going to try to check it out this week. It's not quite uh, so much a martial arts film as it is very much like, like Die Hard All right. and, and such. All right, well, now we're going to go on to our critics' choice. Like I said, this week, keeping with the Holly, Hall, Halloween. Halloween spirit, uh, we're going to be doing... Uh, 
monster, alien monster movies, and Aaron's going to start off giving you his top three. Okay, my first alien monster movie. This is really a uh, monster movie. It's the 1982 film E.T., which stars D. Wallace, Drew Barrymore, and Peter, Peter Coyote. It was directed by Steven Spielberg, and uh, it's just a, a classic film, uh, a, a science fiction type film, and it's for the entire family. It's going to be known for 10 years now down the road from, from now, maybe 50 years down the road. It's a great film. Uh, uh, number two on my uh, top three is uh, the 1979 thriller Alien, directed by Ridley Scott. We reviewed 1492. That was a film that uh, he just came out with. It stars Sigourney Weaver, Tom Skerritt, and John Hurt. If you haven't seen this, John, um, John Hurt has an excellent performance, and <laughs> um, uh, that's all I want to say about it because I don't want to ruin it for you. Uh, number three is Alien Nation. That came out in 1988. That stars uh, James Caan and Mandy Patinkin. Uh, it's directed by Graham Bar uh, Baker and was written by Gail Ann Hurd. You might uh, remember Gail Ann Hurd for her work with, uh, uh, with uh, Jim Cameron on uh, Terminator and other films uh, of the like. And that's my top three. All right, now on to my top three. I like to say I am a fan of the genre, but it took me a little, a little bit of thinking to get three because there's so many cheap monster movies out there, and where Aaron took like E.T. and uh, Alien Nation, kind of not really monster movies, I'm, I've picked the true monster horror films. Number one, Aliens, the sequel, one of the greatest sequels of all time, and the reason being, it had room to expand on the, on the original. A lot of sequels like Terminator 2 and Die Hard 2, the original movie is already big and extravagant. Here you had a chance, or when Terminator 2 came out, you really couldn't outdo the original because they were already such a big movie. Here, Alien, the original Alien, was kind of a small-scale movie, and Aliens had a chance to really, this was a big, epic science fiction film, directed, directed by James Cameron, who did Terminator 1 and 2 and The Abyss, a lot of big, epic science fiction adventure films. Uh, we see a very intense film. In fact, it probably has, beyond the, the Russian roulette scene and the deer hunter, which I think is the most intense scene I've ever seen, it probably has the second, third, and fourth most intense scenes of all time. Very a very good, thrilling film, nominated for seven, seven Academy Awards. Sigourney Weaver was nominated for Best Actress. It took the awards for visual effects and sound effects editing. The other awards were like art direction, editing, and stuff. Great movie. Check it out. Number two is uh, my, or on my list is John Carpenter's version of The Thing. This came out in 1982. The reason, there's two reasons why I like this movie. Number one, the makeup, uh, special effects type, is some of the most unbelievable you'll ever see. This is a true gross-out film, a great movie for Halloween. Uh, like I said, on par with the Academy Award-winning effects that came out in The Fly. So if you like The Fly, very similar effects. The thing that amazed me, no Academy Award nominations for this. In fact, in 82, you know what was nominated? Gandhi and Quest for Fire for makeup. I mean, it's unreal that the thing was completely overlooked. And what I also like is, is the way this movie captures the isolation and the coldness of the Arctic because this is Arctic explorers who happen upon an alien organism that's been unthawed. And also the eerie, haunting soundtrack, which I believe was done by John Carpenter. A lot of that uh, synthesizer, pulsating beats, really gives this movie an eerie feeling. Along with that isolation and the, and the feeling of coldness, you almost expect to go outside and see snow on the ground. Very, very eerie music, and a, again, a great Halloween movie for the gross-out fans. And my third is the 1987 Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Predator. I haven't, I, a lot of the films I review right before I like to see, I haven't seen this one in a while, but I've seen it three or four times, which means it's got to be a good movie. And uh, I think the thing that, that people loved about this so much is it's man versus alien, and this time the man has no help from weapons. Schwarzenegger has to outwit this monster who has a lot of high-tech weapons. I think people like that. It's kind of like a first blood type film. And... Uh, one little uh, trivia question. The Predator was played by the then-unknown Jean-Claude Van Damme. So anyway, check it out. It won a uh, visual effects Oscar. Uh, or no, it was nominated for visual effects. Take that back. And a good film. I like Arnold Schwarzenegger's choice of films and the way he's managed his career since he became a star. Excuse me, became a star. He's staying away from the bad films. He's picking the good stories. He's staying away no matter what the money is. For instance, Predator 2, he's probably offered a lot of movies. He said, uh-uh. He's picking good films, and I like that. And those are my top three favorite alien monster films. Okay. Why don't we take a look at what the uh, home video releases are? Home video releases. All right. This week, let me find my little list here. 
coming out, which I believe today we have the babe. Uh, with uh, who was in that? That was uh, John Goodman. I yeah, that's the movie about yeah. Babe Ruth. Batman Returns, the sequel to the hit Batman. That's with Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Michael Keaton, and uh, uh, I don't. Did that Danny movie do as well? No, it uh, it it fell short uh, just yeah. slightly, but uh, uh, great, probably a good. Movie. I haven't seen Batman Returns. I like to see it all. The Cutting Edge, and also Sleepwalkers are coming out today, tomorrow, or the twenty second, which I believe is tomorrow. A movie called Folks will be out on video, and then going on to this week in pay per view, you got Ernest Scared Stupid. I uh, haven't had a chance to see that one. That's Jim Varney. <laughs> and the Mambo Kings, Fried Green Tomatoes, which was nominated for quite a few Academy Awards, particularly some of the women were nominated for act acting. And Amityville 92. I don't know what number of the sequel this one is, but uh, <laughs> it's the 92nd 1992 one. version of it. All these, for more information, uh, you can check out on the Channel 34 for uh, showtimes and prices. Okay. Each week on Film Forum, we have a special guest, and this week is no different. We have Willard Stevens of Black Eagle Special Effects, and uh, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to, uh, to show a display that, that Willard has set up here in the studio. And if we could uh, get a camera over there now. Yes, this is a four-bullet special effect. He told me to tell you all about that. This is like in the action-adventure movies when you see bullets riddle. This is it. Okay. There it okay. is. <laughs> All really right. Really loud. <laughs> As Willard comes on back to the set. Hi, right, Willard. Loud, loud <laughs> Welcome to the show, Willard. Thank you. Okay. Yep, we'd like to go ahead and welcome you oh, to the yeah, show. How you doing, Willard? Thanks for coming on. See you again. Might want to pull that chair up a little bit here right. to get more in the picture here. Okay. Oh, you dropped your mic. Okay. <laughs> see if we can go ahead and put the mic back on. And we'll go ahead and start here. I brought a book in that is, that is Industrial Light and Magic. This is the, the Star Wars stuff. Are these the kind of special effects that you do? No. Those are more uh, film overlays and, and uh, I guess, computer hmm. uh, you know, effects. Ours is real effects. And uh, when, when you see something happen, or when we're doing effects, when you see it happen, it's real. If you see somebody walk through fire, they're walking through fire. If you see a car explode, that car is blowing up. If you see a building fall, a, a wall fall, that's what's happening. It's all real. So yours are like more of the explosion stunts right. type of stuff versus sure. the mm -hmm. Star Wars miniature models and that kind of stuff. That's correct. Has there ever been anything that you've come into that was just too dangerous to film and you said no? Uh, not so far. Not so far? No. We've, we've done some pretty good size explosions. But with the right money, anything's possible. Huh? Oh, yeah. Can you give us an idea of some of the stuff that you have done? Uh, like most recently, I guess. Well, of course, I worked on a lot of movies around here that, and also TV shows that, uh, that you know, I'll Fly Away. Uh, worked on Heat of the Night the other night. I didn't, I didn't do special effects on those two shows, but I worked on those. Uh -huh. uh, I, I guess the one, my, one of my favorite was The Return of Swamp Thing. Oh really? Yeah, and uh, a lot of uh, you know, a lot of effects in there. What kind of effects did you do for that? Uh, can you give us an example? A lot of explosions. Uh, we blew up uh, the uh, the lab, the the, the uh, scientist lab, uh -huh. uh, and uh, blew up blew up one of the creatures as he jumped. You know, as he jumped in the water, he exploded. And, mm. I was uh, looking at uh, your list here of some of the things you do, and it has like weapons. Do you have a, a training in as far as the history of weapons and or what kind of training did you do? And okay, do you know a lot well, about weapons and a lot about explosion. How do you get uh, into this without killing grown, yourself? I've grown up with <laughs> weapons. You know, my dad had weapons. You know, hunting weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of that. When I was 12 years old, I had my first gun. Uh, uh, and, and just you know, all all of my life, I've had these weapons. Uh, went in went in service at a you know fairly early age. And of all things, wound up in a tank battalion, and uh, nothing but weapons. So got a pretty good idea there on on how to handle weapons and safety, which really my dad taught me the safety. And how do you get involved? I mean, I know you just can't walk up and start doing these effects because I mean, is it somewhere you have to know someone? And they kind of let you buddy sure, around with sure. them for a while. There, uh, I first worked 
in spe in the motion pictures, in special effects with Bob Shelley, special effects. And they're down at Lakewood. Now. Right. Yeah. Right. And I worked with Bob for three and a half years. Uh, I've been off on my own now for about three years. And uh, it's uh, work with Bob Shelley just uh, just Sunday night. So mm -hmm. I do a lot of freelance work too. You know, it's it's uh, there's a lot of uh, effects people in Atlanta. So the work we just spread around and we help one another. Right. You know? Can you tell us something about the safety involved in, in doing these special effects and such? Because I, I remember uh, you saying something about having a, a, a fire extinguisher and, uh, and proper clearance and stuff. Right. Uh, well, my theory is, is, is I was taught that by Bob Shelley, safety first. I mean, if it's not safe, make it safe. And if, it's not, if you can't make it safe, don't do it. Have you ever walked away? From somebody no. that didn't want something to do safe? For Not instance, you made it safe? We made it safe, right. Like in the sure. uh, Twilight Zone movie where they did the special effects and yep. a couple people I'm, got killed. I'm familiar Is that with something that. that shouldn't have happened? Uh, should have been more thought probably given to that. Uh, you know, all the, you, you've got to look at all the possibilities, you know, uh, of what could happen. And uh, I think maybe they were in a hurry. It was at night. There was some things that you couldn't see. Uh, probably something might have, might have blown up and hit hit a propeller. It's it's really hard to say what happened then, but I, I would say they should have spent more time. With could it. have been avoided then. It it could possibly have. Right. Okay. Uh, what well, one other question is the range of costs from special effects, uh, the stuff you do. What's the cheapest? What's the the most expensive effect you've done? Free. <laughs> <laughs> Free to I would say probably. Uh, up in the fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Seventy. What, okay. what did that involve? That's my personal myself. Okay. Uh, just a lot of it, you know. General, general special effects through the whole movie, through a oh, whole through feature. the whole movie, right? Okay. Seventy thousand. Right. And it did include a little bit of everything. Okay. Right. Thank you, Willer, for showing up today. Yeah, we That's appreciate That's all the time it. that we've got tonight. Uh, we'd like to uh, remind you to tune in next Wednesday night at ten p.m. for Film Forum, when we'll be having uh, two new feature releases. Our critics' choice will be classic horror, as well as uh, uh, human just horror. just human horror, and uh, we'll be having a, a special effects makeup artist on next uh, week here on Film Forum. So why don't you uh, tune in next week then, 10 p.m. Check us out.